morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, I uh, watched the big game last week. First grade Cropper versus first grade Smith at Briarwood Elementary School. Did you see it? <laughs> uh, were you thinking about a different game? Uh, my, my, my boys, I got two boys, they play basketball. They really love basketball. Uh, they dream about playing basketball for a, a local state school. I won't tell you which one so as to preserve the peace. But they dream about playing basketball. And I'm a dad who likes to inspire the dreams and encourage the dreams of my kids. But I'm also very realistic. Do you know what I mean? I got to be a little coy right now because my kids could be listening. They're in the building. But um, let's just say their future is not tied up in their dreams. You with me? One of my children, is, um, he's in first grade, and he's the one that I went and watched uh, last week. Uh, my third grader uh, was also playing a game at the same time, but I was solo parenting, so I, you know, like many of you sometimes do, you have kids playing multiple games, multiple times, different schools. I had to send the older one off with some friends. The coach had to kind of help him. And I went with the younger one, and, um, and it was just, it's just rough. It's rough. It's a rough world to be a dad of a first grade basketball player because they, ha they have ambition, they have drive, they have desire, they have no skill. In fact, my, my first grader is going to be an amazing basketball player. He's really, he loves the game. He's so passionate about it. Just doesn't really know how the game works. And so this past uh, week, I'm, I'm sitting there watching with him and, and he's running up and down the, the court. He's running great. I was actually surprised. I was like, man, you're really fast. But I noticed um, throughout this season, it's like six, seven games he's played, uh, he, he runs the court and then he stands under the basket and he does this. Holds his own forearms. I've never seen this in my life. If you're not a basketball person, this is just, I want to clue you in, this is not what we call an athletic stance, okay? Like he just does this. And it's bothered me, his mom, over the course of enough weeks we're kind of like, man, we got to work with this kid a little bit. Make sure he like gets, you know, this will be more fun if he can like, you know, just get his hands open and like be ready for the ball and like be able to get in there. And so I, as a good dad, I, I created a game. It's called, get the ball! Okay. Here's how the game goes. I, um, I, I'm leveraging the power of a brother rivalry. In my basement, I'll take a ball and I'll simulate a loose ball. And I, the, the game is my first grader has to get the ball before my third grader does. And my third grader is totally in on it. He knows. He's like, I know I'm not supposed to get the ball. And my first grader has no idea that the third grader is kind of like letting him get the ball. But it's really inspiring his courage and helping him out. And so, so here's how it goes. I roll the ball and I go, get the ball! And um, my, my first grader, he does amazing. He's incredible. He throws punches to his brother's gut. He'll kick him and trip him. He'll throw him down, and then he'll go leap on the ball, and he gets it every single time. It's amazing. Last week, after a ton of get-the-ball training, I'm sitting on the sideline watching my son. <laughs> and there's already an a aggressive dad in the stands on the other side of the court. And you know how like youth sports, there can be sort of like this pull for dads to prove their world domination through the athletic accomplishments of their kids. And I could tell this gym is not big enough for there to be two of us. You know what I mean? And so I'm, get the ball, get the ball. Like I'm struggling, you know, I'm as a dad, I'm like, oh, on, get the ball. And I've had it, I've just had it. Get in the car afterwards. We're driving to the other gym to go pick up the, the third grader to see how his game was. And I'm talking to my first grader. And I, I hesitate because what I want to say is, you were inconsequential today. That's what I want to say. And I started by saying, buddy, you were inconsequential today. Literally, that's how I started my speech to him. Good dad moment. I didn't tell you this was a good story about me. I'm just telling you what happened. And I'm, I'm, I'm debating how far into this problem do I go with him because of all the signs around these leagues, you know, Gable, three and two, they all got these signs that say, parents, make the ride home your best play of the day. And I want to make it my best play of the day, but I want my kid to play, you know what I mean? So I'm like torn. I'm like, do I crush his dreams or do I like help him out? And so I decided to say, hey, why is it that we can play get the ball in the basement and you get the ball, but on the court, have you ever realized like, you don't get the ball? <laughs> and my first grader, 
he looks up at me, he goes, what do you mean, dad? I said, well, buddy, you're like running around like this. He goes, I don't do that. I said, I have video proof that you do this. <laughs> he goes, well, dad, I can't, I can't hit people because then I'll get a foul. And it was this moment where my eyes widened and I was like, oh, I can work with this. And like a good dad, I look in the rearview mirror and I say, buddy, you get five fouls. You should use them. <laughs> he goes, what happens when you get five fouls? I said, well, that's actually pretty bad because they pull you out of the game, they sit you down, and you just have to watch the rest of the game. He goes, yeah, I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want to get any fouls. And I said, buddy, you are incapable of getting five fouls the way you're playing right now. Don't worry about that. What you want is to get four fouls. You want to get four fouls because you get four fouls. Dad's am I right? You know, mom's am I right? You want to get four fouls because you, you get fouls. You're trying hard. Like there may be incidental contact. You don't want to be a bully, you, but you want to play. You want to get your hands out there. You want, to, you want to take the game. Like this is what I paid all that stinking money for is for you to try. You want to play with four fouls, I tell him. And then once you get four, you can run around like this. But until you get four, you should just be out there ready to make some contact. And he's looking at me, and I'm, that's all through the rearview mirror, you know, and trying to be so compassionate and whatnot. At this moment, we get to the gym of my third grader, and um, my, my son really doesn't want to keep talking to me. He's done. You know, I've, I've exhausted the capacity for coaching in the moment. And my third grader, it's great. He, he hops in the car. He's really chipper. And I knew the team they were going to play was the best team in the league. I knew they were going to lose. DraftKings had the over-under at 10. And so I, I was aware that, like, it wasn't going to go their way. And he gets in the car. I go, hey, man, how'd you guys play? He goes, amazing. We lost by six. I was like, whoa, great job. But um, how did you play? He goes, oh, I did so well, Dad. I got four fouls. <laughs> I've never been prouder as a dad. <laughs> my my six-year-old looks at the mirror, and he just goes this. <sighs> I look back, and I go, see? It's a, it's a growth point for a kid learning how to play basketball, how hard to manage their effort, right? It's to, to learn how much I got to push, how much I got to pull, and, and to actually engage or to disengage, to be afraid of falling out or to, to not be afraid at all of making contact. And I think all of this has been like a metaphor for my own faith. I think about the ways that Christians engage society or the game of life, if I can even use that metaphor. And, isn't it true that we kind of fall into these two categories? This is universally kind of how we're wired. We have foul out Christians out there, and we've got no foul Christians out there. Our predisposition, depending on who you are or what you're worried about, some of us are just attack at all costs. Who really gives a, a darn? We're going to go all out because we have a mission, and so we're going to foul out for Jesus. And honestly, that's not going well for followers of Jesus in the public sphere because people are looking at us going, we don't like what you're doing. On the flip side, there's another impulse where we've got some of us who are just so Jesus and me, I don't want to be a, a bully, I don't want to be accused of being a hypocrite, and so I'm the type of person who my faith is between me and God anyway, so I'm just going to lock up and I'm going to disengage. I'm going to be on the court, but I'm not going to make a difference because I don't want to get a foul. I don't want to be accused. And I don't know, someone else is going to score the baskets for me anyway. I'm just going to back off. And I feel this in my own heart. I'm not telling you how you are. I, I'm telling you how I am. I, I feel this in my own heart. Whenever a world set against Jesus is looking for a hope and, and I know that I've got something to tell them about my story, how God's given me hope, I feel inside of me this tug of war between passivity and aggression, between wanting to foul out and wanting to not foul at all. And I don't know if what type of Jesus follower you are. If you're the type that kind of plays with reckless abandon in your faith or if you're the type that plays super cautious. But where we come to in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 today, Jesus is going to coach us for how he expects us to be engaged in the game of life when it comes to our faith interacting with society. And this is really good news because I think we've got a lot of different opinions about how we should be acting in the world. And Jesus is going to set it straight for us no matter if you're a foul out or a no foul person. He, he uh, shares very famous words for us to help us understand how to make the most out of life. I want to uh, say one more thing before I get into the, the text, Matthew chapter 5. If you're looking up, you can follow along. The, um, a couple of years ago, uh, 
2021, a group called Barna, they do national research. They um, asked a lot of people my age and younger, millennials and Gen Z, some questions about faith. And what they found was that 47% of people my age or younger thought that it was morally wrong to share their faith worldview with someone who was not a Jesus follower. 47% of people my age or younger believed that it was a foul to actually try and give their faith to someone else or share their faith with someone else. I don't know if that surprises you or not. That's just kind of what the statistics were. What was interesting to me is that twice the amount of people, so 94% of the respondents, when they were asked what would be the best outcome of those conversations, they all said the best thing that could ever happen to those friends of mine who don't follow Jesus is that they could have a conversation with me about my faith and then find God for themselves. We know what the goal is in this life. It's very clear for people to find God through our lives. But we are very mixed up on how we go about engaging. And it's for that reason that I think these words of Jesus are so poignant for us today. Now, I want to just make sure you guys' eyes don't gloss over today. These are words that you've heard before in multiple contexts. And I hope today, maybe through some, some history and some storytelling, they take new meaning for us and, and keep us uh, new afresh with what God wants for our lives. So uh, with that, uh, y'all with me today? We all good? We can jump in? Y'all with me? Foul out or, or no foul people? I don't know what you are, but Jesus can give us Give us the answer. Here's what he says. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Everybody say salt of the earth. Salt of the earth, it means good people, right? I mean, that's how we use it. If, if you're at a funeral of someone who was like a, a truck driver or an inv invested grandmother or like an honest car person, you'd say they're salt of the earth type of people. It's like, a, it's like a good person. That's how we use it today. I'll tell you how Jesus meant it. It didn't mean that. If the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? I want you to notice this word, but it's like a con contrast, right? So you're the salty of but if you lose your saltiness, the quality of your life that makes you the thing that you are, how can you be made the thing that you are again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Uh, you are the light of the world. You've heard this before. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill, a town on a hill cannot be hidden. Politicians love that phrase. They, they just love it. They can't help but use you. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. Everybody say, see your good deeds. And glorify your Father in heaven. Um, Father, as we come to your word, we just ask right here, right now, would your spirit through me speak to us in our hearts to help us see how you would have us live. This is a super familiar passage. Um, two metaphors work together to form a unified principle and how Jesus thinks that we should engage with our city. If you've ever wondered what impact should I be making here in Kansas City, right here in whatever town it is that you live in, whatever subdivision your home is or apartment building or complex that you find yourself living around, my, my job, my business, how, how do I make a difference in the world? Jesus tells us right here what he expects and he uses two utterly basic principles. Salt and light. One early church father, a guy named Pliny, said that the two most useful things in the world are salt and sunshine. Jesus says the same thing. What I want to show us is how they worked and how, how these two ideas, salt and light, are actually connected to each other. And so let me just walk, walk through it. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. And what he doesn't mean is that his people are just going to be considered good People. The word salt was actually uh, the same word that we get the word salary from. Uh, on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, maybe a monthly basis, you get a salary for the work that you do. In the Roman world, that was your salt. Actually, salt rations was how the Roman, em uh, the Roman uh, army was paid. And today we have uh, inflation and all this stuff that kind of mixes up our prices. People get angry when eggs are very expensive because they're like, whoa, I can't buy eggs for my family because there's so much money. And, and, and sometimes our dollar gets deflated or inflated, like all that stuff. The Roman army was notorious for rebellion if ever the salt rations changed. Because this is how people would use uh, the most precious uh, yet ordinary element that people would use in their everyday life, salt. If you've ever said a phrase, that person's not worth their salt, first of all, I hope you don't use that phrase because that's pretty mean. It means they're not worth the money they're making or they're not, they're not worth the investment that we've 
given to them. When Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, he's saying to his followers, you are the gift that I'm giving to the world to help them do two things. The first, salt was used to preserve food. So if you go out and you kill a deer and you bring it home and you process it, you've got the the moment that thing dies, you've got a, a clock starts before the decaying process, right? This is kind of gross, but this is how it works for us today. The decaying process will take time before that meat is no longer good. So you want to interrupt the flow of that and you want to actually preserve the meat. And so you go, you process it. Salt was the number one way to preserve meat from decay in this time. So people would have on hands a tremendous amount of salt in their possessions. Salt was also a religious um, instrument because it would be used to purify the sacrifices. Preservation and purity. This is what salt did. It was a very conservationist element. People had mounds of this and they would actually keep it in their backyard and they would, they would, they would scoop what they needed and kind of like you have firewood maybe for your fire and they would, they would use it and they would use it up and they would have to keep getting more and more. Jesus says, my followers are those who are going to be those who preserve the world from decay. Decay cannot resist the salt, the effects of the salt. And my followers, Jesus said, are those who are going to go out into the world and help preserve the world from all that sin is trying to do to ruin it. That's a tall order, don't you think? And then Jesus says, you're the light of the world. He says, you're the light of the world. Now, um, we just sang a song that said, Jesus is the light of the world right? Waymaker, all that stuff, light of the world, that is who you are. And Jesus, in John chapter 8, says, I am the light of the world. Very comfortable with that statement. Jesus, all the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus coming to this world talk about like a light shining in a darkness, like, like, like the darkness cannot resist light whenever it, it comes in. And Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. But, but here in the Sermon on the Mount, he actually says, you are the light of the world. If Jesus sang worship songs, he would be like, that is who you are. You are salt and light, but in a more imaginative, lyrical way, because he'd be Jesus. You know what I mean? Like, like I can't sing it, but like, there's a point. Like, Jesus gives us this identity. He sings over us this fact that you're salt and you're light. If you look back at the verse, it doesn't say you're like salt or you're like light. He didn't say you are a salt and you are a light. He says you are the light. Definitive, unique, special, called out. Now I'm uncomfortable with that because I want Jesus to be the light of the world. We know how light works. If you've had a kid, you put them to bed and the, they turn off the lights. All of a sudden in the dark time, all our eyes can see are shadows and forms. Left to our own imaginations, those shadows and forms take on tremendous power over our lives. Until a kid gets so scared that they race into their parents' room, they say, hey, something's in my room. And you as a parent, you kind of wonder, is there something in their room? So you take your iPhone flashlight or you walk into the room and you're just bold enough to flip on the lights. And what do you do? You, you bring light into the darkness and the light brings truth. The light reveals what is real. It exposes the reality. Jesus says, the followers that I have in this world are going to be like those who live in a dark place where they, they reveal what's true, where, where people no longer have to be afraid of what they only imagine. They can actually understand the reality of God's love on display here in this world because of their lives. This is what Jesus means for it to be salt and to light, be light. You and I have tremendous power and distinction in the world, don't we? We, we have a calling, we have a purpose, we have a, a priority to our lives. You say, okay, so why did Jesus say salt and light? Like I get that were these elements that really, you know, decay cannot resist the salt and darkness cannot resist the light. But why did he talk about this? What do we do with this? And the clue comes from not how these two are related in their success, but how these two are related in their failure. Jesus gives a statement, you're the salt of the earth. And then he says, but if salt loses its saltiness. Now, in our day and age, I've never known salt to lose its saltiness. I've never gone to the cupboard, found a box of salt that was from, you know, 2019, and been like, oh, gross. That salt has lost its saltiness. Never thought that. I've never ha eaten at a restaurant and been like, oh, it just feels like they use spoiled salt. You know what I mean? Like, I've just never... Maybe that's Taco Bell, but I've never, 
never had that thought about like this salt's gone bad. And that's kind of because highly refined salt in our day and age is highly stable. It doesn't actually lose its properties. Uh, sodium chloride is a pretty stable substance and that's, that's great. But when, when Jesus um, lived, he wasn't talking about the highly refined salt that we use and put on our tables. The rock salt back in Jesus' day had, had all sorts of impurities mixed in with it. Things like gypsum and maybe some other rocks and whatnot. And it wasn't highly concentrated. And so what they would do is they'd have storehouses, little sheds of salt and just kind of pile it right there and you'd use it up and you get down to the bottom and the salt crystals that would have contacted the earth, the soil for long enough, would leach its salt-like properties into the ground and you would be left with just these kind of white, opaque rocks. And everybody knew that you didn't, you didn't use that stuff. You didn't, it was too mixed in with with, with the soil, with the earth, that all you would do is you just start over. You'd scoop it all out. You'd probably just dump it right in the road and let people walk on it. And then you'd start all over. It's the salt that made contact with the earth for too long that had lost its purpose. And do you see the metaphor in that? There's a warning here, a foul, the way that we can mess up our saltiness, our distinction. Jesus says, you know, the salt loses its saltiness. I just want to say it this way. If we get too cozy with the world... We can be too cozy to make a difference. That you and I as followers of Jesus, there's a caution, there's a concern Jesus has. Don't get too cozy with the world that you lose your distinction. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I, I think we get this. We understand that Jesus called us to be separate and unique, that there's got to be a quality to our lives that stands out. But one of the ways that we can lose our uniqueness is by too much contact with the earth, too much stagnant, stale contact where we don't actually get to be put in play and useful. I think about this in my own life. When I'm out in society, I was at a gathering late last night with some guys who coach baseball, wondering, God, how do I make sure that I'm distinct in this group? How, what are the values of your kingdom that I bring to this seven-year-old baseball team? to make sure that I'm not just acting like everyone else. Because when, when Christians today climb the same corporate ladder as the world, we get cozy. And when we are obsessed with the same materialistic attitude as the world, we get cozy. There's a, a uniqueness about our community that Jesus calls salt. And what's not cozy about church is actually the thing that makes us radically attractive and radically different to the world. It's, it's things like a place in which people come from every single ethnic, socioeconomic background with different political leanings and different priorities for the world and yet their lives are surrendered to one person, Jesus. And within this room right here, if we were to talk politics, it would get incredibly uncomfortable and I would quit. Because all of us have different perspectives and different ideas. And what I love about this church, what I love about Heartland, this is one of the really rare places in America, I so love you for this, is that we have people on both sides of the aisle and in between. And yet, this is not a place where we are marked by our political persuasions. We have a higher king. I, 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 I belong to a lot of communities. I've got alumni associations and I've got a running club that I run with and I've got parents that I coach with and I've got a softball team that I play with and I've got a, a PTA that we connect with I refuse to be a part of, but I know some of you are and that's beautiful for you. I love that for you. <laughs> but in all of these spaces, there are, there's a commonality to them. I was out running yesterday with my running club and we're running around the, the area and it's fun. It's a lot of fun, but it's made up of people who are absolutely insane. They wake up early on a Saturday when there's a threat of rain and it's cold and they choose to run very long distances on their own volition, not even running from anything, they're just running. <laughs> That's weird. They all have that in common and is that distinct in the world? Is that going to change the world? Maybe it'll change someone's health, but it's not going to change the world. What makes this place unique, the most precious place in the world, is the church, where you and I come from every different background, and it doesn't matter how fast you run or what you do or what you think, just simply that you know God is for you. And that covers everything. 
so that you and I can actually become like a family. When the world sees that, we, they, they see people who are rejecting their own will, who are pursuing humility, who are willing to live in an authentic way where when they, when they fail in this world, they confess their sins one to another. Who in the world would do that except for people who have been marked by Jesus? It is a radically transformative community in which you and I belong. It is so radically different that, that while we live in the same world that the world is in and while we live in the same county that we live in and, and while we all have kind of the same types of lives, we do so radically different, making sure that we don't stagnate in our contact with the world lest we become like everyone else and lose our effectiveness. Jesus says, don't let your salt become unsalty. The problem is one of contact, too much contact. And that, that Jesus kind of flips it. He says, if the salt is a problem of contact, the light is likewise a matter of contact. Not wanting to lose your purpose or your flavor in this world is why a lot of Christians go to the other extreme. A lot of followers of Jesus will say, well, if, 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 if I don't want to be spoiled by the world, then I'm going to just, I'm just going to pull out of the world. I'm just going to back up. I'm just going to, this is between me and God anyway. What does it have to do with them? I'm content to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, strength by myself. And Jesus says, such people are like those who believe they are a city on a hill. There is so much I want to say about this phrase, but a lot of it is, is um, truly speculative. This is a very enigmatic statement. And actually, my working thesis, I want to say working thesis because I want to demonstrate some theological humility. I'm not entirely sure that I'm right, but I have textual and contextual proof to kind of prove what I'm about to say. I don't think Jesus wants us to be a city on a hill. Contra everything politicians have told you since the 1960s, when JFK said that we were a city on a hill, when Ronald Reagan said that we were a city on a hill, when in 2016 Barack Obama said we are a city on a hill. We all love this metaphor because it's exceptional. And yet Jesus uses it in the same way he talks about salt becoming unsalty. If you look at the parallelism of what Jesus is teaching, it's important to take everything in context. If you look at the parallelism, Jesus makes a statement, you're this, but then here's a negative thing. And then Jesus says, you're the light, but then he gives this. As if to say, if you're afraid of making so much contact with the world that you lose your purpose, it is possible that you would go to the other extreme where you withdraw from society, you go up a mountain, you build a society, you try and provide security and safety and separation from the world so that you don't get spoiled. And what does he say next? He says, a city on the hill cannot be hidden. As if to say, you can run away, but you cannot hide. As if to say, if you want to pull out of the world, that's great, but you're going to be seen at night. Why? Because a city on a hill has light. And it's the worst kind of light. It's an aloof light. It's a far away light. It's a star in the sky kind of light that doesn't actually have any practical value to the people in the earth below. No one can look up at your city and go, wow, this is helpful to illuminate my path. No, they go, oh, that's where the city is. I'm not there. This is why Jesus says neither, it's a negative quality, neither does anyone light a lamp and put it under a bowl. You don't hide the thing that has effect in this world. If, if salt fails or has a foul because of its contact with the earth, light fails because it does not have enough contact with the earth. Do you see it? Light gets hidden. You can be too cozy or on the flip side, you can be too concealed. Concealed. You can be too concealed to make a difference. We as a church were birthed out of a desire to never conceal the light of God here in Johnson County. We as a church, our, our leadership has a heartbeat that we would do anything that we possibly can to reach this world for Jesus, to help you know that God has a path and a plan for you. His name is Jesus, and he can radically change your life and, and, and get you out of whatever that mess is that you've made for yourself and give you hope and peace and courage and bravery. But that's, that's available to you. That's our heart and our hope for you. And we have that heart because we don't ever want to be accused of having the best news in the world that isn't shared. Jesus says, no, what you do is you take the lamp and you put it in an intentional place on a lampstand so that everyone in the house can see the light. I think it's interesting that Jesus kind of points up at a hill and says, a city on a hill can't be hidden. But what you need to do is take the light and put it in the middle of your house. 
There's a really interesting metaphor that he's working with here. That the light needs to shine brightest at home. Or at least in the areas of your life where you live, work, and play. With the people that you rub shoulders with. See, Jesus wants us to be mixing it up in society, but he also wants us to be cautious as we do so. To maintain a distinction while we are together. There's this incredible story about how this works. It's told in a book called One at a Time by uh, a pastor of a church in Louisville named Kyle Eidelman. He tells a story um, about a guy named Alfred. Alfred was in a gang in South Central LA when one day he was in an alley scrounging for food. And in that same alley was a Midwestern woman who was on a mission trip with her church who was lost. And this woman trying to figure out which door she came out of and which alleyway she could find her way back to, is looking desperately to get home and she stumbles across Alfred and Alfred stumbles across her and Alfred says she looked like she was terrified. And he understood why. Because he was not necessarily the cleanest of guys. Not just tats and whatnot, but just he smelled and he was kind of not taking care of himself. And he said, you know, my stomach was growling so loud that she could hear that I needed food. So this woman looked at Alfred and said, hey, I'm, I'm very lost. And here's where I need to go. Can you help me get there? And if you get, get me there, I actually have a ton of access to food. We would love to feed you, maybe even some of your friends. But can you help me get to where I'm going? And Alfred, so moved by this woman's desire to be helped and to help him. This just like human moment in the back alley of South Central LA, he led her to what he found out was called the Dream Center in LA. And Alfred got a meal and found out that they had tremendous amounts of food at this place where Christians were just handing out food. And Alfred, over the course of a year, would go back time and time again thinking about this woman who had brought him to this place. And he would receive food. And he would receive the fact that God loved him so much that he gave Alfred gave his own heart to Jesus. And over the course of a year, Alfred started to then do exactly what this woman, this woman did for him. He would go find members of his gang and one at a time, he would bring them food on a daily basis because this is what that woman did for him. And over the course of a year or two, this, this, this guy found out that peace was coming to his gang. And Alfred decided that he was going to step it up, not just from caring for his own people, but he was going to cross gang boundary lines and bring food from the Dream Center to a rival gang. And within a matter of years, three gangs halted their activity or their war in this area because Alfred had found something that was truly unique in the world that met his need, and he started feeding rival gangs. Here's what, here's what I love about this. Kyle Adaman points this out in his book too. He says that the, the LA government had tried for decades to try and bring harmony to all of these people in rival gangs. Spent thousands and millions of dollars to try and accomplish this. But one woman, meeting one guy, walking together to hope, bringing light to darkness and salt to the earth, changed a city block, brought peace to the world. Um, I don't know how you feel about that story. There's a lot of kind of context to that and some interesting things. But what I, what I want you to take away from it is you don't have to be an extraordinary person to be salt and light. It's just about being you. I think Jesus would have said, um, you are my dragons of the world and my dinosaurs of the earth. You would have been like, yes, we're special. But he says, no, you're just ordinary salt and you're ordinary light. Go, make a difference in this world. And so I, I, I want you to see where Jesus pushes us. He doesn't want us to be a no foul type of person. And he doesn't want us to be an overly fouling type of person. Where he wants us to put it is incredible trust and confidence that someone else on our team is making the shots if we just get ready to be in the game. This is what Jesus says. He says, watch this, watch this. He says, let your light shine before others. It's essentially get your hands off your forearms and be ready to play the game. He says that they may see your good deeds and then look what will happen. They'll glorify your Father in heaven. That they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. One of the reasons that this is so hard for me is because I don't want to be the type of Christian that draws attention to myself. I don't want to be the type of person that makes it about me. 
When Jesus says, you got to let your light be intentionally out there, mixing it up with people so that they see your good deeds. I struggle with this because I'm, you know, trying to inspire us to follow Jesus, but the only story I have right now that I want to tell you that's like a not braggadocious story is a couple weeks ago, we got some snow. And um, I want to be the type of person that, that shovels my neighbor's driveway when it snows. And I don't ever do this. I never do this. In fact, one time I did this, I shoveled the, the driveway of my neighbor across the street back in Indiana, and only to find out they had a professional snow service coming 20 minutes later. I was like, <sighs> so, so I, don't, I don't ever do this. But I got a neighbor who's, um, you know, at the, at the age, he would say, he's at the age where he doesn't like to lift snow because of the potential risk for heart attack. And so I realize out there, there's about six swipes at his driveway. And I'm standing in my second story overlooking the cul-de-sac going, I want to be the type of person who shovels my neighbor's driveway when it snows. So I got my boots on. I got a shovel. I walked across the cul-de-sac through my own unshoveled driveway. And I started working. And it was easy. It was easy snow. This was not Chicago snow. This was Kansas City snow, which is wimpy snow. It's the dumbest snow. It's stupid snow. It's not even snow. It's like white powder. And I'm thinking to myself, I hope my neighbor doesn't have cameras. You know, like the ring? Like, I don't want him to know it was me. I want him to think it was the guy next door. That's what I want. I want him to think it's, it's, it's Bill. And I'm, I'm pushing, I'm doing the thing, I get it all done, I walk away. I go out to get my mail the next day. And my neighbor, Bill, the guy next door, comes outside and he goes, hey, thank you for shoveling this guy's driveway. He goes, I wanted to be the type of guy that shovels my neighbor's driveway when it snows. But I felt my heart getting tight when I did it. And so I went inside and I waited. And I was like, oh my goodness. This wasn't for him. It was for you. And one small act truly gave an opportunity to talk about neighborly kindness and a love that sacrifices for others. My neighbor, it turns out, was in Hawaii. <laughs> and Bill told him that I helped him out. The other day, stuff's melting, and this other guy comes over, and he helps me. And you know, this is how the world becomes closer, is by letting others see your good deeds and eventually they give glory to your Father in heaven. What this means is you cannot screw this up. You can't. You can't mess it up. Jesus is like, hey, go let it rip. You are salt. You are life. Like the only way that you will fail is if you fail to try. And so here's my question for you is, is who is it in your life that God has positioned around you? By name, if you can think about them, that's even better. But what are the realms in your life where you know God's saying, make a difference. Speak up. Step out. Like, I wonder what cause you would try and bring a solution to in our society if you knew you wouldn't fail. Like, if you just knew that this was a holy pursuit, that God was going to do something through you, that, that whether or not you got credit for it or not wasn't the, the point, but you saw an injustice, you wanted to correct it, what would you try if you knew that Jesus was calling you to try and be the salt and the light there? Go try it. Go do it. I don't think anything frustrates our Father in heaven more than watching his kids on the court of life with their hands on our forearms, afraid to get dirty. If you want to know what Jesus is saying when he says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, he's saying this, I want you to play the game with four fouls. Go get in there. Go try. Because you can't mess it up unless you fail to try. Let's not be too cozy that we lose our distinction. Let's not be concealed that people can't see. What Jesus wants is us to, common people that we are, show the world how much we've been changed. And they're going to say, wow, you're just like me, but something's different. You're just like me, but something's different. And at that moment, you get to say, I'm just a person who Jesus has helped. Father, this is so so simple, so hard. 
but we, we rest secure and confident in the fact that you promise that you will build your church. You promise that your kingdom will come. And what strikes me, God, is you don't want to just make it happen. You want to work through us. So thank you. Thanks that you've given us people to love and a world to be invested in. Help us as followers of Jesus to continue to be distinct and to be countercultural in this world as we make a difference to the people that we love all around us.